Please take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 2. In this book of Revelation, the Apostle John is relaying the vision he saw and the messages he was given to share with the servants of Yeshua regarding future events. John says in chapter 1 verse 4 that he is sending this revelation to seven churches and assemblies as a better translation in Asia. And remember now that Asia here does not mean the continent of Asia. In Bible times, Asia was a province of the Roman Empire that we know today as Asia Minor. It's the area that we think of as Turkey. And these seven congregations were all located in a relatively small area. And then notice in verses one, uh, 12 and 13 that in this supernatural vision, this revelation from Yeshua, John saw candlesticks around one like unto the Son of Man, referring to Yeshua. And the candlesticks are actually menorahs. And as we go through the book of Revelation, we will sometimes use the image of a master menorah with seven mini menorahs where the lamps would normally be, just as a way to help us organize and better understand the information that's being given to us. In the final verses of chapter 1, John introduces us to information that leads us into the first group of seven mini menorah events, the seven letters to the seven assemblies. If you look at page 5 in your handout, the page that's entitled, the many menorahs of the book of Revelation. The first many menorah on the far right represents these seven letters to the seven assemblies, the called out ones, the assemblies of Jews and former Gentiles who had become believers and were grafted in, and most of them were meeting in synagogues at the time, not churches in the modern sense. Yeshua through John is sending out letters of concern, of correction, and of encouragement, addressing seven different spiritual conditions in which we can also find ourselves. And it's encouraging to realize that no matter what condition an assembly is in, God reaches out to encourage it to get back on track. And even though these congregations, these these uh, seven assemblies, most of them have their defects. Yeshua has not abandoned them. Now on page 8 in your handout, you'll see a close-up of that mini menorah. And it shows the names of the seven congregations. And these seven letters are like love letters from God. And they include a report card. And each letter includes the same seven components. There's a greeting that also names the city of the assembly. And then a title or description of Yeshua, some unique description or characterization that's in each message. And then there's the commendation. People always receive correction better if they've been complimented for their virtues first and congratulated. And then we find the concern or the criticism or the rebuke. It's some sort of correction a warning about faults. And then there's an exhortation, which is encouragement showing what they can do to right their wrong. And then a promise, a reward for those who overcome their weaknesses. And then finally, a closing, which is the same. It's he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. Now the order of these components isn't always exactly the same. And it's interesting that two of the assemblies have nothing good said about them. And it's also interesting that two of them have nothing bad said about them. And as we go through the seven letters, try to look for these components in each letter. Now last week we studied the first letter which was written to the assembly at Ephesus. Ephesus was a major seaport city of about 500,000 people on the western coast of the Roman province of Asia. It was the greatest and wealthiest city in Asia. And it was a prominent center of culture, 
politics, commerce, religion, magic, and pagan superstition. And there was also a robust Jewish community in Ephesus, and it had the most important Messianic community in Asia Minor. But Yeshua tells them in verse 4 that the congregation there had fallen out of the love for Yahweh and for Yeshua and for the gospel of the kingdom that it had in the beginning. And they're warned to repent or else Yeshua would remove their life from the world, which suggests that they would no longer be part of the body of Messiah. Or at least not an effective part. One lesson for us here is that this clearly shows that believers and even entire assemblies can lose Yeshua's pr approval even after starting out well. He wanted them to repent and get back on track. The assembly at Ephesus maintained an outward appearance of faithful life in Messiah while in reality they're just going through the motions and they don't do the first works which are works of obedience obeying the commandments of God and the Torah and the works of charity good deeds and, and assistance to those who are in need and all of that to be done in love it seems that they were diligent on doctrine but they were too busy with the business of the king to spend time with the king in loving devotion to him and one last thing before we go into John's second letter today Notice the exhortation in verse 7. It's the close of the first letter. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the assemblies. Now this exhortation, as I said, it's exactly the same in all seven letters. If you have an ear, the words in all seven of these letters that comes from the Holy Spirit of God, the Ruach HaKodesh. There for, for you, if you have an ear, there for all of us, for all believers and all assemblies of God's people. You know, every assembly on the planet has some elements in common with these seven assemblies in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. So all seven letters uh, uh, apply to all assemblies in varying degrees. And they apply to each of us individually on a personal level too. And we're not expected to simply hear these letters or read them without responding to them and acting on them. Remember that in the Hebraic way of thinking, to hear something means to obey them. Obey them. To hear someone means to obey that person. Both words, hear and obey are the same word in Hebrew Shema so if we don't obey the words we really don't hear them according to the Hebraic mindset and understanding and the ultimate reward that Yeshua promises to the assembly of Ephesus for faithful victorious obedience is the freedom to eat of the tree of life which results in eternal life in paradise, in the kingdom of God. As part of our salvation from everlasting death, this is the foundational reward for all faithful, obedient believers at the end of Revelation. If we'll always remember our first love and stay close to Yahweh and close to Yeshua, and consistently repent for our sins and walk in faithful obedience, then we can look forward to receiving this reward. Be an overcomer, and he says, you will eat from the tree of life. And now let's go on to the second letter. It begins in verse 8, and I want it's short, so I want to read it to you before we discuss it. Beginning in verse 8, the Bible says, And unto the angel of the church or assembly in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last who was dead and is alive. I know your works and tribulation and poverty, 
but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of them who say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried. And you shall have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the assemblies. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. Now this second letter is addressed to the angel of the assembly of Smyrna. And as we have previously learned, the word angel in the greeting of these letters could mean either a messenger, human or angelic, or the leader of that congregation. It's true that in the Jewish synagogues and in the early assemblies of Yeshua's followers that the leader was called the messenger of the assembly. And the word could have a double meaning here, representing both a leader like the pastor of a congregation and an angel that is possibly somehow involved. And let's remember that the word church in our Bibles is actually a very poor translation of the Greek word ekklesia. The literal meaning is called out ones, an assembly of people. It could be any assembly of people for any reason, but biblically it meant a group of believers within the community of Jews and Israelites, not something outside of it or separate from it or distinct from it. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen speaks of the church in the wilderness referring to the children of Israel with Moses at Mount Sinai. And the Greek word for church in this verse is that same word, ekklesia. So the ecclesia that Yeshua is building, or building onto, was not a new entity in Acts chapter 2. It had already existed for over a thousand years. It was not some new non-Jewish religious group or some building associated with either the Roman Catholic Church or any Protestant denomination, none of which even existed yet. It would be far more accurate to translate ecclesia as assembly or congregation. And it means both individual congregations and all of them together, the entire body of Messiah. You know, originally the congregations were made up of Jews who believed in Yeshua. And over time, believing Gentiles were grafted in and they joined them in their synagogues. But eventually, the non-believing Jews forced the believers out of their synagogues. And the believers met in homes and gradually started their own synagogues. Now, the English word church can be traced back to the German word kirche, which referred to the place of pagan worship of Circe, the daughter of the sun. And over time, it evolved into the word church in Britain. That's where the word church really came from. It actually has pagan roots. Again, this, uh, this assembly that's receiving this second letter was in the city of Smyrna, which was the main commercial center of Western Asia Minor. And this was such a beautiful city. It had a reputation for being the loveliest city in Asia Minor. And it was a prosperous city. It was located about 40 miles north of Ephesus. It had an excellent harbor. It was a major trading port. And today, it's a thriving city in Turkey known as Izmir. And it's the third largest city in Turkey. Now, when you look at the word Smyrna, do you detect a word within that word? Myrrh. There is a connection between the words Smyrna and the Hebrew word myrrh. Myrrh comes from the bitter gum of trees or shrubs in Arabia and Ethiopia. And it's used for burning for incense. It's used in perfume. It's used in anointing oil for priests, purification of women. It's used in anointing the dead. And it's used as a pain reliever to reduce suffering. 
So it is associated with suffering and death. Yeshua's body was anointed with myrrh by Joseph and Nicodemus. And myrrh gives off its characteristic scent, its fragrance when it's crushed. And it's interesting that when the Magi came from the east with gifts for the young king of the Jews, Yeshua, they brought gold, which is associated with royalty, frankincense, which is associated with priesthood, and myrrh, which is associated with suffering and death. But according to Isaiah chapter 60, verse 6, in the millennium, which is Yeshua's 1,000 year reign on the earth in the messianic era, gold and frankincense will be offered to him, but not myrrh. Why won't they bring myrrh like they did before? It's because Yeshua's death is behind him once and for all. Smyrna was an ancient city. I see what happened now. Those slides were in the wrong order. Going back at least a thousand years before Yeshua. And it was destroyed more than once. The first time around 580 B.C. by the king of Lydia. And it sat there in ruins for three centuries. And then it was rebuilt. And it became one of the greatest cities of the world at that time. In 27 B.C., it came under the control of the Romans. And between 178 and 180 AD, it was destroyed by earthquakes. And again it was rebuilt. And then it was demolished again by earthquakes in 378 AD and once again rebuilt. Smyrna was a major center of politics, culture, and religion, both Jewish and pagan. It had the temple of Zeus. Zeus was known as the father of the gods. And there were shrines to Apollo, the sun god, and Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty, along with shrines and statues of other gods and goddesses. Now, Smyrna had strong ties to Rome even before the Roman Empire was as big and strong as it got to be later on. And it, Smyrna was one of the early places to advocate the worship of Caesar. In case you didn't know it, in the Roman Empire, Caesar came to be regarded as divine, as deity. He was considered God and worshipped as God. There was even a temple in uh, Smyrna to Tiberius. Now, within the Roman Empire, people were allowed to worship whatever gods they wanted to, but they had to acknowledge Caesar as number one above all other gods. And there was an annual ritual that involved throwing a pinch of incense into a fire and declaring Caesar as supreme lord. Believers who refused to carry out this ritual in this declaration were burned at the stake or fed to the lions in the arena. So persecution of the assembly was severe there, to say the least, by both Romans and Jews. And you know what? In today's world, radical Muslims are executing believers who refuse to submit to Allah and the Islam faith. They're trying to make Islam the only religion in the world. Their goal is to make everyone submit to Allah, join the Islam faith, or die. Now there's an interim step where they'll let you live if you pay them a tax. But eventually, they want you dead if you don't submit to Allah. That's what's going on in this world today. And it's picking up steam and snowballing or it's becoming an avalanche as it, it's becoming more prevalent all over the world. Verse 8 reminds us that this message comes from Yeshua the Messiah who uses in this letter the title of the first and the last 
who was dead and is alive. Now back in chapter 1, he identified himself as the first and the last using the words Alpha and Omega in Greek, although he probably spoke the Hebrew words Aleph and Tav. Either way, it's the first and last letters of the alphabet, and it represents the first and the last. You know, Yahweh, Father God, calls himself the first and the last three times in the book of Isaiah. Yet Yeshua is also called the first and the last. If you get a knock on your door from a Jehovah's Witness, Share that with them. It'll drive them crazy to say that the one who is the first and the last who was dead and is alive, how can God die? They maintain that every occurrence of the first and the last in, in the Bible is always Jehovah. No, sometimes it's Yeshua. We know that verse 8 of chapter 2 has to be talking about Yeshua because it says he was dead and now is alive. The point is that the only way for both Yahweh and Yeshua to be the first and the last is for both of them to be design, uh, divine, to both be deity. The Son of God, Yeshua, shares in the divine nature with his Father Yahweh. They're both part of what we think of and call God. The Godhead is like a family with a father and a son. And then in verse 9 we see the commendation of the assembly at Smyrna. Yeshua knows their works in spite of tribulation or difficulties. He's most likely referring to the persecution of believers that began with the destruction of uh, Jerusalem in, in uh, 70 AD by the Romans. This was serious trouble and it was crushing them. Now don't get confused. The tribulation that John speaks of here in verse 9 is not the great tribulation. That takes place in the final years before Yeshua's return to establish his kingdom. The word tribulation here means oppression, affliction, distress, or trouble. And we all have some degree of those problems from time to time, don't we? Now they could have gotten relief from most of their persecution and tribulation by just throwing that little pinch of incense into the fire and declaring Caesar to be Lord, but they didn't do that. It just wasn't real easy to be a believer in Smyrna at that time. And again, the early persecution of the believers there came from both Jews and Romans. Now tradition says that John, the Apostle John who wrote this book, trained a man named Polycarp who he later appointed to be the bishop of this congregation in Smyrna. Now, in time when the persecution got really hot, Polycarp was confronted and he was told, deny your faith or die. He wouldn't do it. He would not deny his faith and he was executed for it and he said, quote, 80 and 6 years I have served him, talking about Yeshua, and he never did me wrong. How can I now blaspheme my king who has loved me so? And to make an example out of him, they burned him at the stake on a Sabbath day. He was hated by both Jews and Romans. Yeshua says he knows their works and their tribulation and their poverty. Now most believers there belong to the lower classes of society. And the Greek word for poverty here indicates extreme poverty. Although Yeshua says they were rich, at least spiritually. Let's never ever forget that there is a richness in the spiritual things of God that are available to us that has nothing to do with our possessions or our wealth. And Yeshua then warns them of those who say they are Jews yet are really not because they're actually part of the synagogue of Satan. Now who were these people? They're going to be mentioned again in chapter 3. There's different ideas about who these people were. One idea is that it may refer to some philosophers 
possibly Aegean, who were attempting to replace the Jews. One of their early books says, quote, We philosophers who embrace this faith gain the whole truth and enter into spiritual Israel. Thereby we become the true and perfect Israel. Now this idea that spiritual Israel completely replaces literal physical Israel in every way is a false concept that has led to replacement theology. Now I'll come back later to discuss more ideas about these who say they are Jews but are not. In verses 10 and 11, we see the exhortation portion of the second letter. And notice that John begins with the words, Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. It's extremely important for us to trust Yahweh and to trust Yeshua's instructions to us here. If we say we trust Him and we have faith in Him, then we have nothing to fear. And there's actually a very, very good reason why we must not give in to fear. You say, oh, I can't help it, I'm afraid. You better not be afraid. In Revelation 21, verse 8, we see that the fearful are included with those who will have their part in the lake of fire. This is serious stuff. Don't be afraid. Yes, we will almost certainly experience some persecution and suffering for our faith, but we mustn't be afraid. Fear, fear is the opposite of faith. Now this could also be talking about those who cause fear in others. But scripture tells us repeatedly, fear not. That's contrary to faith. Now in verse 10, after Yeshua says that the devil would cast some of them into prison and that they would be tried, he says, you shall have tribulation ten days. Well, does he mean ten literal days? Some scholars say that this is a Hebrew idiom, a figure of speech that simply means a short period of time. Another view is that ten days represents ten periods of time Ten periods during the reign of ten Roman emperors, beginning with Nero in 54 A.D. and ending with Diocletian in 313 A.D. These were emperors who directed the persecution of believers for about 250 years when Christians were falsely blamed for famines and for pestilence. They became a scapegoat. And it actually became a crime to be a Christian. Five million believers died for Yeshua during this time, according to Fox's Book of Martyrs. The reward promised to the assembly at Smyrna, be faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. It's, it's like that of the Ephesians, perhaps even better, because they're promised this crown of life meaning everlasting life eternal life is not promised to those who are passive in their faith but to those who are faithful unto death even if it means dying for our faith if we ever find ourselves threatened with physical death because of our faith we must be faithful even if it gets us killed, if we want to have the crown of life. Now, in Scripture, faithful believers are promised various types of crowns. There's this crown of life for those who suffer for His sake. We re read about it here in Revelation 2, verse 10, and also in James 1, verse 12. There's the crown of righteousness for those who love His appearing. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 8. The crown of glory for those who feed his flock. 1 Peter 5, verse 4. The crown incorruptible for those who press on steadfastly. In 1 Corinthians 9, 25. And a crown of rejoicing for those who win souls. In 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 19. 
Now these two congregations, Ephesus and Smyrna, are like a picture of God's promise of eternal life after death and of salvation. And then finally in verse 11 we have the close, the he that has an ear let him hear, and the promise to the overcomer. And just like it did in the uh, letter to Ephesus, the promise comes after the close, kind of like a P.S. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Now we'll discuss the second death more when we get to Revelation chapter 20, but I will say this for now. It's being cast into the lake of fire. And remember this. If you're born twice, you'll only die once. But if you're only born once, you'll die twice. Now I have a question for you. In this letter, what were Yeshua's concerns about the assembly in Smyrna? Do you see any? No, there weren't any. He didn't give them any negative criticism. He had absolutely nothing negative to say to these poor, persecuted believers at Smyrna. He just encouraged them to, to hang in there until they received their reward. Now, how can we apply this second letter to our lives? Well, for one thing, again, let's not confuse all persecution with the Great Tribulation. Yes, there will be intense persecution during the Great Tribulation. Worse than any other persecution before or after. But there's another level of persecution that virtually all believers in Yeshua have experienced to one degree or another. Some worse than others. And as the end times events come to pass, we will see a significant increase in the intensity and in the frequency of persecution that's directed at the body of Messiah. We see it already as believers all over the world are experiencing a greater level of persecution than our generation has ever seen. It's hard to pick up a newspaper or listen to a newscast on TV or radio without hearing about some story about another round of persecution against believers somewhere in the world. It's, it's daily almost. Someday it may be extremely difficult for large churches in our cities to continue to operate in the public eye. Eventually congregations, especially those who more closely follow the teachings of Scripture, may have to go underground and function under the radar in order to survive. Now before I discuss a more personal application, I want to get back to the identity of those in verse 9 who say they are Jews but are not, and who are the synagogue of Satan. And this doesn't mean that they're Satan worshipers. That's not what he's talking about. It means that their actions are influenced by Satan. And there's a lot of ideas about who these people are, such as those who are Jews by birth, but not Jews spiritually. And it, there's some truth there. Being a Jew should mean more than just having Jewish DNA. Paul makes it clear in Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, that Circumcision of the flesh alone does not make one a Jew, spiritually speaking. It requires circumcision of the heart, in the spirit, and praising God, not men. So not all physical Jews are Jews spiritually. And he says in Romans chapter 9 verse 6, that not all who are Israel are Israel. The way he says it is in the King James is, they are not all Israel which are of Israel. In other words, not all who are descended from the man Israel, Jacob, really belong to the nation Israel, the people of God. 
If our actions don't line up with the Word of God, we may not be part of that family. John says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 10, In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whoever does not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loves not his brother. And I didn't think about this till just now. But does not righteousness? That means obey the Torah. And loving your brother. It's not blindly obeying the commands and ignoring the needs of people around you. Yeah, love your neighbor and your, and your brother as yourself. But do it as we're obeying God's commandments. And in John chapter 8 verse 44... Yeshua told the Pharisees who were trying to kill him that their father was the devil, not God. So in Yeshua's day, the synagogue of Satan may have included the Pharisees and the Sadducees who rejected him and were trying to kill him and they later persecuted his followers. Okay, that's one idea. Now some say that most of the current residents of Israel are descendants of European converts to Judaism who say they are Jews, but are they really? When the Jews were carried off to Babylon in 586 BC, Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar colonized Samaria with other people. Some people call them counterfeit Jews. And then after the Bar Kokhba revolt in 135 AD, Emperor Hadrian basically cleaned out the Holy Land of all the Jews, both real and fake. And the Babylonian Samaritan Jews eventually relocated to Spain where they became known as the Sephardic Jews. And they were joined by some of the Khazars, a tribe from Turkey whose descendants are known as the Ashkenazi Jews. So this other idea is that the synagogue of Satan may have included these European converts who have no physical connection to Israel and they have their Babylonian Samaritan synagogues. Another idea is that these people are Gentiles who are pretending to be Jews maybe even really believing that they are actually Jews when they really aren't. For example, did you know that Mormons claim to be descendants from the tribe of Ephraim? To them, that makes them Jewish. Now, we should consider the possibility. I, I tend to think of Jews as just being those who were descended from the tribe of Judah. And if you were from the tribe of Levi, then you were a Levite. If you were from the tribe of Dan, you were a Danite. And technically, that's correct. But in the real world, the way language is used and evolves, many times the word Jew is applied to any Israelite from any tribe. So we should consider that possibility that the word Jew here in, in this verse in Revelation could mean more than just the descendants of the tribe in Judah. Sometimes the word refers to those from all the tribes of Israel. So, so we may need to consider the possibility then that these people in verse 9 might claim to be Israel. Not necessarily Jewish. So that makes me wonder could these Jews who aren't Jews be those who claim that Israel forfeited her promises and so now those promises are given to the church? In other words, could these people be those who believe in replacement theology even if they don't understand what they believe? If they believe that because Israel rejected her Messiah, then all of those promises that God gave to Israel are now transferred to the Gentile church. 
and that the new covenant has replaced the old and that the Gentile church has actually replaced Israel as the people of God, then they believe in replacement theology. That's what it's about. And that, unfortunately, is what is taught in most churches today. But that's blasphemy. And it makes God out to be a liar. One of Paul's main points in Romans 9 through 11 is that God is not done with Israel yet. Replacement theology has contributed to anti-Semitism. And it was one cause of the Holocaust. We've got to understand that Gentiles who repent and become believers don't replace Israel. They become part of it. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2 beginning in verse 11. Therefore remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh. You used to be physically a Gentile. That at that time you were without Christ. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. And strangers from the covenants of promise. Having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Messiah Yeshua. You who sometimes were far off are made near by the blood of Christ. And skipping to verse 19, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints. Citizens of what? Israel! And of the household of God. And in the next chapter, Ephesians 3 verse 6, he continues, The Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Before you were saved by the blood of Messiah, if you aren't of Israelite or Jewish physical descent, you were a Gentile in the flesh, without Messiah, an alien from the commonwealth of Israel, and a stranger to God's covenants. But if you have repented of your sin, your disobedience, and if you've come to faith in Yeshua, now you aren't an alien or a stranger anymore. Now you're a fellow citizen, a fellow heir of the same body, grafted in, as Paul says in Romans 11, adopted into the family of God's people that is known as the Israel of God in Galatians 6 verse 16. Again, Christians don't replace Israel as the people of God. They join it. We become part of Israel. And therefore, we participate in all of God's covenants with Israel, including the Mosaic Covenant to obey God's commandments. It's a very sad thing that so many Christians have been taught that if they just believe in Jesus, they'll be saved and they'll go to heaven when they die. And in many cases, if not most, they're never taught one word about the need to repent of their sins and, and the need to live according to God's standards. And if you think that through, that means doing your best to obey God's commandments, which are found in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. The common Christian approach to evangelism is very shallow. And it's nothing like what Yeshua and the apostles preached they constantly and consistently preached, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And repentance of sin, which is disobedience of God's laws and commandments, is at the heart of the gospel. And the bottom line is that if we aren't at least trying to obey God's commandments, we haven't really repented. That's the honest truth, and most churches aren't teaching that. And I'm afraid that many who think they're saved will find out one day that they aren't saved after all. Even some of those who are busy as beavers in ministry activities will get the surprise of their life according to Yeshua in Matthew chapter 7 beginning in verse 21. He says, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, 
haven't we prophesied in your name? Let me set this up for you. They've already been judged. And they, they're understanding that they're not in the place where they thought they were. And they're, they're raising objections to the judgment. They're arguing. They're saying, hey, what are you doing? Haven't we prophesied in your name and in your name cast out devils and in, in your name done many wonderful works? And Yeshua says, and then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Whew, I don't want to hear those words. When he says to them in verse 23, I never knew you, he will be pronouncing a guilty verdict on these people who made the claim that they knew him and did all these things in his name. They want their actions and their good deeds to secure a place for them in the kingdom. But the truth is, they were never in covenant with Yahweh. And he says, depart from me. Not depart from the kingdom. Depart from me. The essential element of life in the kingdom is living in the presence of the king, Yeshua. And when he says, depart from me, you that work iniquity. And please understand that that word iniquity means lawlessness. Torahlessness. When he says that, he can't be talking about sinners in general or else no one could be admitted into the kingdom. He is dismissing those whose lives are characterized by works of prophecy, by casting out demons, and even performing miracles. Their, their lives are characterized by works of iniquity, by sin and by lawlessness, even though they are performing miracles. Folks, spouting prophecy, casting out demons, and even performing miracles, these things do not make anyone a true disciple of Yeshua. What matters is living a transformed life of obedience and loving God and loving our neighbors through the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeshua's judgment on Judgment Day won't be based on anyone's performance of supernatural signs and wonders, but on our faith in Him as our Messiah and on our submission to Torah as demonstrated by our acts of love to others, especially to those who are part of our spiritual family. And He clearly says that only He who does the will of the Father will enter the kingdom. We better know what the will of the Father is. And we better be doing it. His will is stated throughout the Bible. And the foundation for His will is His teaching and instructions and commandments in the Torah. That's where most of it is stated. And it's so sad. I mean, it breaks my heart to think that most Christians have been taught that His complete will for us today is stated only in the New Testament. And that we can just ignore His everlasting laws and commandments in the Torah. Folks, it's all His will. Don't misunderstand me. I don't want to sound like I'm picking on the Christian church. I thank God for the Christian church because most of us came to know about God and Yeshua through the Christian church. And they teach a lot of things that are right. But at the same time, there are some serious issues and they're teaching some things wrong. I don't care how much you prophesy. I don't care how much you cast demons out of people. I don't care how much you perform miracles and signs and wonders in His name or any other spiritual fireworks you've got going on. He says that if you're not doing His will, which includes trying to obey His laws and commandments in the Torah, then you are practicing lawlessness. That's what iniquity is. And if that's you, He will say to you, depart from me. I never knew you, you worker of iniquity. 
And the fact is that many, if not most Christian churches, do indeed teach a form of lawlessness regarding the laws of God, whether they realize it or not, by teaching that His commandments in the Torah have been abolished, or that they are only for the Jews, or that there is some distinction between moral and ceremonial laws which the Bible does not make, or that the Torah is simply passé and irrelevant to our modern world so we can just disregard it. You know, it's commonly taught that we only need to learn certain spiritual principles that are expressed in the New Testament. But the truth is that everything Yeshua teaches is based on Torah. So to be against the Torah is to be against Yeshua because that's what he taught. So, to summarize this idea, some scholars do believe that in verse 9, those who say they are Jews but are not, they include the advocates of replacement theology who say they are true spiritual Israel and have claimed the promises that God made to Israel for the church. And that's just wrong. Now, for a more personal application of this second letter to Smyrna. Not only will the body of Messiah experience more persecution in the end times, and not only the, the congregations that make up the ecclesia of Yeshua individually, but also individual people like you and me can expect more persecution in our lives. Paul writes in 2 Timothy verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 12, All that will live godly in Messiah Yeshua shall suffer persecution. He doesn't say might suffer. He doesn't say may suffer. He says shall suffer. And, and what percentage of those who live godly in Messiah? Is it half of them? No, it's all of them. All who live godly in Messiah, Yeshua, shall suffer persecution. If you are a genuine, faithful, obedient believer, and you're not suffering any persecution, just wait. It's going to happen sooner or later. And if it never does happen to you, that should be a wake-up call to you that maybe your faith isn't as real as you think it is. Genuine believers will surf, suffer persecution and trials from time to time, and it's just going to get worse and worse in the future as we get closer and closer to the time of the Great Tribulation. And there are some good reasons for believers to face trials and tribulations. You know, if we never had any trouble, we would get complacent and lazy and weak and ineffective. We need to be exercised. We need to be challenged. We need to have obstacles to overcome. And when we're off track, we need something to get us back on track. It's like sandpaper taking the rough edges off. It has been said that you can best discern a person's true character by observing them in times of trouble. You know, it's easy to claim to be a faithful follower of Yeshua when things are going well for us. But often, it's a very different story when the road gets rough. The Bible has a lot to say about trials and tribulations, and it's filled with example after example of God's faithfulness. So, why then do believers struggle with our faith whenever we have trouble? If we really believe that God is good, if we really believe that He loves us and cares for us, then why are we so quick to turn our backs on him in anger and in resentment when things don't go our way? Failing to anticipate 
trials is a serious mistake. Yeshua suffered them, and he promised them to us. All the apostles suffered trials. And the bottom line is that trials are to be expected in our lives. And if we'll understand that, it'll help us to prepare and be ready for them when they come. I want to share with you some of the reasons that we face trials. These come from Chuck Missler. To glorify God. We read that in Daniel 3, 16 through 18 and 24 and 25. Discipline for sin. From Hebrews 12, James 4, Romans 14 and 1 John 1. To prevent us from falling into sin, 1 Peter 4. To keep us from pride, 2 Corinthians 12. To build faith, 1 Peter 1. Those are all pretty good reasons to face trials and tribulations. That's just half of them. To cause growth, Romans 5. To teach obedience and discipline, Acts 9, Philippians 4. To equip us to comfort others, 2 Corinthians 1. You know, if, if you come across someone who is suffering from some situation, you can do a lot better job of ministering to them if you've been there. If you've had that same experience and had to learn how to deal with it. To prove the reality of Messiah within us, 2 Corinthians 4. And for testimony to the angels, according to Job 1, Ephesians 3, and 1 Peter 1. And finally, there are two key passages to help us understand how our trials and tribulations help us. In James chapter 1, beginning in verse 2, he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works or produces patience. But let patience have her perfect worth, work, that you may be perfect and complete, wanting nothing. And then also Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, that we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces endurance. And endurance produces experience. And experience produces hope. So, as we endure our trials and tribulations by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can glory in the hope and the promise of the crown of life eternal life in the kingdom of God with our King, Yeshua the Messiah. So hang in there, no matter how tough it might seem sometimes, because in the end, I looked at the back of the book, we win. Be an overcomer of life's difficulties, and you can be sure that the second death won't hurt you.